So, does anyone know what happens when you ask your friend if there's going to be any architecture sessions at the next DrupalCon? Yeah, this guy right here says, not until you make one, get cracking. So, here we are. Uh, in case you walked into the wrong room, let me get introductions out of the way. This is the path to becoming an accidental architect. Uh, I am Patrick Tellia. I work for a company called Powtech. Uh, right now I'm contracted to the US Forest Service. A little story about the title of the session. In October of 2014, I had my second interview at the Forest Service. And uh, during that interview, they had all kinds of questions, which apparently I answered to their satisfaction. They were all about enterprise Drupal architecture. They even mentioned that they were already satisfied with my developer skills uh, via the pre-interview steps. And my first interview, and were only interested in the ideas around enterprise Drupal architecture. Now, I call this accidental because the position I was in for NBC at that time uh, was just a, sort of a senior Drupal developer role and not Drupal architect. And they weren't hiring for Drupal architect. This was a couple of interviews in before I heard any of this. <laughs> and um, uh, so it wasn't even in the job description. There's nothing about it. The, the whole pull was that I, I could start working from home again for the same pay, and I was pretty good with that. So, but my job since then has been pretty much entirely filled with architectural decisions. That's, that's been my role. Um, I came on, we had two other developers, and they just started asking me, okay, how are we going to do this, and how are we going to do that? You're the Drupal expert, so solve this for us. So, um, probably a good time to tell you, this entire session is going to be recorded, so you don't really have to take notes. The entire slide deck is going to be on the session page when we're done, too. So, don't worry about it, just sit back and enjoy. Also, up until about 45, 50 minutes ago, I was editing this, so I don't have it all memorized. Um, so I'm going to be looking at my screen quite a bit, just to get that out of the way. I am pretty comfortable with the material, but I changed it so much. So uh, you'll notice the strong Lego theme here, too. We'll get into that in a minute. So what are we here for today? I can think of a couple reasons why any of you in the audience might be here. Maybe you're looking to figure out how to go from where you are now, like Drupal developer or possibly lead or project manager, uh, to Drupal architect. You want to know how to do that. Um, maybe you're trying to figure out if you already are an architect. Or maybe you're like Larry and you're here to heckle me. I don't know. Most of you are probably in that first group. Making the purpose of the session, how to help to build a better you so you can help your customers better. That's marvelous. That sounds great. Um, how am I going to do this little bit of magic to make you better when you leave than when you came in? Well, we're going to do it by following a path from one of my favorite books, uh, The Success Principles by Jack Canfield. In that book, it's all about getting from where you are to where you want to be. Um, I've applied that to numerous things in my life, and it's worked really, really effectively for me. So I figured I'd put it on this. So let's break this down into a few steps, one or two easy steps. First, we're going to talk about the definitions of architecture, uh, software architecture and Drupal architecture, what they are, how they're similar, how they're different. Uh, this is going to cover the where you want to be part. Next, we're going to talk about where you are uh, on this path, which, of course, is the where you are part. And then next, we're going to be talking about the largest part of the talk, which will be how you get there. Um, in that part, I'm going to be talking about traits that make up an architect, or really anybody who wants to be better at building solutions. And then uh, we're going to cover some resources that I've been either reading or watching or uh, happened into over the past for this session. At the end, I'm going to let you in on some of the things that experts have tweeted back at me, um, and then I'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions. If we have any time left after that, which we won't, because uh, this is probably going to run a little bit long. Um, we'll get out early.
So when I started doing this, I was basically interested in how to apply software architecture paradigms to Drupal. Um, and to do that, I started looking at the definitions for software architecture. And I'll tell you, they're vague. Um, there's, there's no set definition that I could find that covered everything that I had been reading or viewing. Uh, Wikipedia has an okay definition, and for, this, for the purpose of this talk, I think we're gonna use that one. Uh, their definition is that a software architect is a software expert who makes high-level design choices and dictates technical standards, including software coding standards, tools, and platforms. The leading expert is called a chief architect. I think we can break that down into a couple of key points. They're an expert. Uh, they're a software expert. They make high-level choices. They dictate technical standards. And we can infer from the rest that they know how to communicate these things because they don't live in a box and not talk to people. So that doesn't seem too bad. I think we can work with that. Obviously, beyond this definition, there's a whole vast world of stuff that you could discuss relating to software architecture. There's understanding large code bases. There's testing tools. There's, there's a whole world out there that's beyond this. But to start, we're going to start at this point. The software architecture world is a very broad and flexible one, just so that we know. Now, let's look at our neck of the woods. What is a Drupal architect? <laughs> there's, there's no Wikipedia definition for this, obviously. So uh, I basically made one up and asked my friends, and they said, yeah, that's OK. So we're going to go with that. And it is a Drupal expert with lots of site building experience and a variety of project sizes who understands all aspects of the Drupal site creation process and is able to effectively develop and communicate a plan of how a system involving Drupal should be executed. I'll wait for Larry to take the picture. There we go. Right. <laughs> I should have that there earlier. I don't know how long it would last before somebody just it. Probably Larry. So we can break this one down into a definition or the definition this person would be a Drupal expert. And not just a part of Drupal, um, not like a front-end expert or back-end expert. This would be all of understanding all of Drupal. You don't, and I don't mean an expert in every part. I mean somebody who literally understands how it all works together. This person would have a breadth, not a depth of knowledge. Um, it doesn't mean that they can't understand something in, in depth, but that's not the requirement. Next. They can devise a plan of things involving Drupal. Note this doesn't say only Drupal. Uh, it's things involving Drupal. Drupal's part of larger systems very often. Uh, and they can communicate this plan that they devise. So are they the same? Definite sort of. Uh, there's a ton of similarities, but kind of more on a micro scale. Uh, both require expertise, experience. Uh, this one is kind of the same. Both make high-level design choices. In Drupal, this is called develop a plan of system involving Drupal, but it's basically the same thing. Sometimes dictate technical standards. This wasn't really mentioned in the Drupal one, but they do do that. Um, I would say that Drupal architects definitely have to dictate project standards, features. You know, coding standards are already kind of in Drupal, but uh, for anything odd, they do have to be the person that makes that decision. And know how to communicate all of the above. That's definitely the same in both. It's a requirement. You can plan all you want, but if you can't communicate it, it doesn't really matter. On the business side of things, uh, it's pretty similar. Architects need to get buy-in from necessary parties. They need to navigate office politics. They've got to be able to talk business, code, systems. They have to be able to translate between all of those. They need to deal with the budget and the human resource constraints and everything. So very similar. Looking a little bit more closely, though, we can see a lot of differences. One of the biggest ones is the fact that these decisions, many of them, have already been made for us. Often we don't have to pick a language or a security type or an architecture. They're already in Drupal. And before anybody says anything, I know that there's a flip side to all of these. I'll get to that in a minute. 
This is because Drupal has a lot of good answers uh, for common questions of the topic of using a CMS. And provided you're using this as a CMS, you're gonna do okay from the start. Though, like with much of what I found in architecture, there's no absolutes. You can flip this around. Every one of these can be something you can override. Uh, take databases, for example. A Drupal architect might want the speed of Mongo, so SQL is right out the door. Um, really, though, the biggest difference I can see between the two is that software architecture would usually determine the technology of a project after looking at all the problems. In Drupal architect's case, we start from here. We start from we have a CMS. And you know, because we know that the answer to we need a CMS is Drupal. <coughs> so fast though, it doesn't mean we get off scot free. Uh, because even though Drupal makes a lot of sane choices for us, we know we still have to think about a bunch of things that software architects have to think about or don't have to think about, like our site structure. We're gonna do a multi-site or domains module, et cetera search engine solutions like Solar or Google Appliance, how to structure your content, entities, taxonomies, panels versus no panels, uh, how to use features, lots of questions. Um, which modules? Are you going to start off with an install profile, asset management, commerce choices, will it be headless? <coughs> how about your development workflow or your content entry workflow? Cache, lots of stuff. So, I mean, uh, honestly, I've I think this list could be pretty much endless. Architects are often going to have to be weighing all of these options against manpower and budget constraints as well. So, taking an earlier example, I get terrible dry foods for these. Taking an earlier example, say our Drupal architect really wanted Mongo, but they don't have any Mongo people. They don't really have a budget to hire three more Mongo people to take care of Mongo. So they're probably going to stick with the three MySQL developers that they've already got. So on every journey, you need at least three things. You need the place you're going to, the place you're starting from, and the mechanism that's going to take you there. So having defined the Drupal architect, we've kind of gone and seen a little bit of what the destination is. In this section, we're going to, or in the section after this one, we're going to talk about some of the things to get you there. But now, I think that we need to take a look at our starting point. Where are you on this path? Uh, are you pretty green, or maybe you have a ton of experience? Maybe you're already a Drupal architect. I don't know. I think that this journey, or any journey of self-improvement, requires looking at where you are so you can build a good plan for what it'll take you to get to where you're going. So I put together a couple of little questionnaires that you can ask or answer to yourself and just think about a little bit. Um, on this one, this is all about the Drupal technical stuff. I have 10 questions. Uh, number one, have you been doing this for a really long time? Do you have a ton of experience? Do you have a particular convention for organizing your features? Or number three, do you not even like features? Or do you have a preference on building themes from scratch or using a particular base theme? Uh, have you provided core patches or been involved in those rather long, drawn out, lengthy issue queue discussions? Uh, have you helped others on Drupal.org or on, in town Drupal IRC channel? Uh, do others come to you first when it's on a Drupal related topic? Are you starting to forget some of the old projects you've done? Yeah. Uh, have you ever said, man, I loved Rush? Yeah. I, I got hands in the air on that one. That's a good one. Uh, do you wish that there was a module that would remind you to clear the freaking cache? <laughs> I do. I want a big orange button that just glows around the screen. Clear the cache, fathead. That's all I want. <laughs> Chances are, if you're nodding to these, you've probably got some of the technical needed to be a Drupal architect, especially the, the first one, experience. It's a biggie. That's half the battle. Next, let's look at the software side. Once again, answer these to yourself or, you know, out loud if you don't have one already. Do you have the ability to talk business side of things with stakeholders? 
haven't had to do much estimating. That's, that's probably the biggest one. Palantir really helped me with that, and I'll get into that later. Uh, do you know how to work in more than one style of project management? You know, Scrum's not the only one out there. Nice job. Are you able to easily come up with many suggestions for Drupal problems? Do you feel confident in those suggestions? Do you get complimented for making technical concepts easy to understand? Are you, do you automatically multiply the amount of time you think something will take by a factor of X? <laughs> the Scotty principle, yeah. Are you comfortable communicating with important people? Have you had projects fail spectacularly? What did you learn? How many times have you recommended that Drupal was not the right solution? That's it. How are you feeling about your answers? You guys nodding a lot or a little so-so? That's all right. If you're nodding your head a lot, answering yes pretty often, you might, and if you answered yes to a lot of the last ones, you might be pretty close on your road to getting towards Drupal Architect. Um, if not, that's why we're here, which is actually a good thing. Now we've talked a lot about the goal of where we want to be. We've talked about where you are. So what are the next steps for getting down the path? Personally, I think this works sort of like a mental transformation. Okay, when you're a developer, you're, you're listening to the architect. The architect listens to you. He takes technical concepts from you, puts them together, and says, okay, here's the plan. You take your part of the plan, you go do the work. It's pretty easy, it's easy to understand. Architecture flips that on its head and says, now you need to listen to people and you need to think of a plan. And then you need to work with very smart people to make it happen. So it's a transformation. It's something that you have to get accustomed to and it's something you have to become comfortable with. That's how it worked for me. Um, and to let you know, right now, I'm labeled Drupal developer. I'm not architect, but I'm doing an architect's job in my job right now. And I'm looking backwards and I'm seeing the things that it took to get to the point where I'm at. You know, I, I had this job, I had that mentor, I got this bit of experience, I went through this horrendous bad deal. And you get to this point where all of a sudden you look back and you realize, <laughs> I've, I've, I've become this thing that I did not expect I was gonna be. And that's where I'm at. So, anyhow, traits. You get a few of these traits, you put them together, you get the mental transformation that happens that makes you the person that could be a Drupal architect. More water. I'll probably go through three bottles standing up here in an hour. So much to work. So what are the traits of an architect? Let's go back to the definition we came up with and take a look. Drupal expert. To me, this says one thing, experience. Lots of experience, I'm gonna say that again. Experience. That is the key, like really the key to being a Drupal architect, is getting the right experience. Second one, can develop or devise a plan. To do this, I believe someone has to be creative. So creativity is in there. I'll talk about why I put curiosity in there in a minute. Uh, and then they can communicate the plan. Pretty obviously this means they need to be able to communicate. So, outside of experience, which covers the first point, I see soft skills as being all the rest. You need to make practical yet innovative creative plans that are good for your client's particular needs. You need to dig to find out what those needs are. After that, you need to communicate the plan and sometimes even sell it. So the road involves creativity, curiosity, confidence, communication, experience. Uh, there's much more you can learn. Beyond that, you're gonna go to industry specific knowledge, general software architecture knowledge, a lot more. There's a lot more to learn. There's always more to learn. But this is a good start. I'll let you take that one in for a minute. Now the top of the topic of experience. Now it isn't a personality trait or a soft skill like the rest, but it is a requirement. In fact, bearing all else, this one would do more for you than all the others put together. 
one of the videos I was watching uh, by Neil Ford on software architecture, he said a software architect is someone who's been in enough bad projects to know one when they see it. And it's funny, right? But it sounds true, and it, it really is. Um, if you want to be a good Drupal architect, you're going to have to have experience. And it's key. So because it's key, you want to get the right kind. And I have some suggestions on that. First, wear a lot of different hats. I mean, do, do work in every kind, every part of the, a Drupal project that you can get your hands on. It, do, do themes. Build a module. Do a core patch. Do documentation. Do everything you can. Touch it all. The, it really helps with that whole problem of every solution is a hammer because every problem is a nail. It, the more you get well-rounded, the less that problem occurs. Next, if you get the opportunity, work on big or bigger sites. It, it's true that on, on smaller site builds, there often isn't a need for an architect because complex business needs are what usually drive the complex technical solutions that require somebody to architect them. So if you can, and this usually happens after getting a little bit of experience, we'll get back to that, get on bigger and bigger sites if you can. Staying with smaller sites, it's easier, especially if you're a small business, like you're an independent developer or a contractor, if you can start contracting for bigger companies or if you can get jobs working on bigger projects, do so. Really, 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 really helpful. You get a lot more variety of the solutions that you get exposed to and it gives you a better base to build from. Um, I've had the opportunities to work on lots and lots of different projects. When I was working at Palantir, uh, they had just a plethora of different uh, clients. Um, I worked with Lullabot, I worked with uh, Form 1, basically everybody. Um, but the diversity was great because it, it gave me experience in different industries and different size projects. Then, after all that, I got an opportunity to work on NBCNews.com. That was fun. Um, thanks to Seth Brown at Lullabot for getting me that gig. That was really cool. Uh, while I was there, I got to take part in the construction of this multi-level profile site, base install profile that we then used as the headless part of today.com, nbcnews.com, and a variety of other things. It wasn't the same architecture as Drupal. It used a completely different architecture. It was uh, headless. It used a queuing system. It, the, the team was vastly distributed. The team was almost as complicated as the project. I, I can't tell you how much I learned on that. The architect of that system was Chris Pucci, and he's here at the con. I'm not sure if he's still here, but that guy is brilliant. I mean, the people that you get to work with, the mentors that you get, are by far your biggest resource. So that's number three. Work with great people. If you manage to get your way in there, don't squander that resource. Mentors are huge. Larry Garfield right here, this guy right here. One of my first mentors, honestly. Great guy. Don't know how many years he actually worked with him, but <laughs> here he is right here. Pound, hit him up for information. Anyhow, it's exciting. It was really complicated, um, and I learned so much there. Uh, ah, yeah. Experience more than just Drupal stuff. So, what I mean by this is try and experience some of the business side of things. Try and say your project manager calls out sick and you've been attending the project management meetings for three months. Offer to fill in. Try to, if your scrum master says, ah, I got a meeting conflict, I'm not gonna be able to make it this morning. Say, hey, mind if I give my hand at that? It, it's not impossible. It's not even all that difficult and it's really helpful. It helps you understand the other side of the problem. Um, do anything you can on the softer side of things. A couple of the other things. Documentation. If you can get the opportunity, well, I'll just say this. Drupal architects, architects in general, if you can make a plan, 
it's worthless if you can't communicate it. And so, and it's all well and good to stand in front of a crowd and talk about it, but if you can't document it, it can't be distributed, it can't be referred to, and if you're not there to answer the questions, nobody can figure out what you're doing. So learn to document, learn to document well. Um, another thing, estimation. Um, I'll say that while I was at Palantir, estimating was probably the task that helped me understand how many important details there are to a large site build. Um, and how to come up with the same assumptions for things that you don't have knowledge on. So, and how to write out all those assumptions. There's probably no better tool I can think of to really understand the breadth of the Drupal project than having to estimate it out. I mean, all the way down to the field level, thinking of it ahead of time so you can figure out how much to charge a client. <laughs> Tiffany had me do that a lot. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was by far the best training I think a budding architect could possibly have. So if you get the opportunity, try that out. Um, I already mentioned project management, so I'll just skip it. So the first trait that I mentioned beyond experience was curiosity. Everybody knows that, well, I won't say that. Architects need to keep up with the trends in technology. Um, software architects need to keep up with quite a breadth of trends. Drupal architects need to keep up with the breadth of trends and then everything else that's going on in Drupal as well. Um, explain a little bit more in the next section, but the gist is that it, you can be a lot more creative with the solutions that you're making if you have a larger base of knowledge to draw from. Um, curiosity helps expand that base of knowledge. The thing about curiosity is that once you have developed the trait of curiosity, it'll help every aspect of your life, not just making better solutions. But if you become curious, you'll have a more open mind and you'll find yourself being more observant as well, making it easier to be creative. That's great, but you know, how do you make yourself curious I find there's a couple things you can do. One of them is to follow your interests. I like all those uh, newsletters that are always coming into your inbox or trying to unsubscribe from, you can't keep up. Actually follow a link or two in those. Look through them, see if something interests you. If it does, click it or go read. So. When you do this, what you're doing is you're opening up new avenues in your mind, new ways of thinking, and you're bringing a fresh perspective to the things that you do by having ingested more breadth of knowledge into your, well, uh, the next thing, actually let me see if I can clarify this a little bit because I totally didn't write that right. Um, when you bring in, when you, when you chase down things, you go off on tangents and you start um, really learning to be curious you expand that knowledge of the things you don't know you don't know, and you turn that into things you know you don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure what that's called. Donald Rumsfeld had said it years and years ago, but there's like three levels. There's all the things you don't know you don't know. And then within that, there's the things you, or above that, there's the things you know you don't know, and then there's the things you know, right? This is taking the world, which is a vast circle of all the things you don't know you don't know, and reducing that a little bit and giving you a little bit bigger circle of things you know you don't know, and a little bit bigger circle of things you actually know. And from that, you can actually build solutions. So, anyhow, don't stop being curious. It really does help with creativity, which is the next section. This is where I start getting a little bit funner. In our definition, curiosity was not really even mentioned, but without it, creativity is a heck of a lot harder. So we kind of build on that. So creativity is the ability to imagine solutions or uh, start thinking up new ideas. And it's a process that's sort of similar to Legos. Follow along here. Say you have a bin of Legos and you have like, it's a really basic set. You got some little four pieces and some six pieces and some eight pieces, maybe a platform, some roof tiles. What are you gonna build with that? Anybody? <laughs> you're probably gonna think of something like a little building 
you, you don't have a lot of options. You're working within your constraints. You have the tools to make a little house, probably gonna make a little house. So now imagine you have some more Legos, you have some wheels, and you have some windshield parts, and you have some angled parts and some cool slick pieces. What are you gonna build after that? Obviously it's gonna get a little bit more complicated, but you already know what you're gonna build. You're working within your constraints. You're probably gonna build a car. So the, the, the available materials really does help to shape what you think of. So expanding your available materials really does give you the better opportunity to build better solutions. And this is why the previous part, Curiosity, basically gives you a bigger Lego bin. Now, when you're always digging around the web in the giant Lego box of technology, uh, you're seeing all the new call, cool JavaScript libraries or you're you know, listening to Lullabots Module Monday and going, oh cool, that's this, or whatever. You're, you're just making a bigger and bigger bin. But that doesn't actually help you think of better ways to build different things with all those pieces. You might still just keep building cars and houses. So at this point, how do you get beyond that? You have to build creativity. You have to enhance it. And basically, you do this by practicing. Um, there's an author named James L. Tucher, um, and he recommends a simple program that he calls Exercising Your Idea Muscle. Now, he calls it a skill, and I agree with him. It's not a special talent. Creativity is not something that's bestowed on just you. It's not given to just you. We, we all have it. We usually wear ourselves out of it, but we all have it. And the way to get more creative is to just start using it more often. Um, it's like practicing a piano. You will eventually get better if you keep trying. Uh, the program that he has it's super simple. It basically, it boils down to exercise your creativity daily. Um, doodle a doodle. Try and whistle a new song. Take a bit of code and make it beautiful. Do something every day. Now, you get to decide whether it's creative or not. And I suggest you go easy on yourself because, you know, why not? It's the practice that matters. The way he suggests that I use uh, is a, a pretty simple program of writing down 10 ideas daily. I'll vouch for this one, by the way. It's definitely helped me become more creative. That's made it so that when I need to, in a pinch, come up with an idea, I can pretty quickly. So if you need a good starter, I'll give you some 10 ideas. So there's just one that I wrote up while I was writing this document, but 10 modules I'd make. Of course, that was the first one I'd think of. I don't know why. Uh, 10 really weird names I could name my kids. I got three of them. I could go on forever on that one. Uh, 10 movies I'd love to see made. 10 reasons why the original Dune book was the best. 10 characters that would have been way better than Jar Jar Binks. 10 things I can do to improve my health. 10 things I can do to improve my mood. Uh, 10 new things I want to learn in Drupal. 10 special cats I would love to see in Miku Atsumi. Anybody play that? It's okay, you can admit it. You get bored, you can pull, check your cats, see if Tubbs has been there. Uh, 10 apps I want to make for my smartwatch. <laughs> and then I went and made one. It was the Deadpool app. I've seen Deadpool before. <laughs> it's out on the public market. It's fun. Um, it's a creativity practice. Now, practice only works if you do it. And it <laughs> uh, consistency is the key on this. You have to do it daily. The, he says, and I agree with him, your creativity muscle will atrophy if you stop. And then you have to do it all over again. You have to keep at it. Um, go simple on this. They get harder. It does actually get harder to come up with 10 lists every day. After about a week, you're going to just not even know what theme to stick to. That's why I did like a 10 list of 10 lists. Um, after getting some experience, actually, some experience and you develop uh, creativity and curiosity, you'll probably have a pretty good sized Lego bin from which to build your solutions. And you'll be able to think up better solutions to build from them more easily. Once you've done that, 
you actually need to present those solutions. And sometimes you have to actually sell those solutions to people for them to actually get used. And this takes confidence. Now, um, did anybody see Dan Lin's presentation downstairs like just about an hour ago? Does everybody know about imposter syndrome? You want me to just skip over this part? Because I can get through this pretty quick. Or are there, actually let's flip that around. Anybody want me to go over imposter syndrome? Okay, let's do that. Now, um, one thing about imposter syndrome, statistic I just read, it said 70%, or maybe it was out of Dan Lin's slides, I'm not sure, 70% of us actually experience imposter syndrome. And you, <laughs> you, can, you can bet I'm experiencing that right now. I'm a Drupal developer telling you guys how to be an architect. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, yeah, um, imposter syndrome is very real. Uh, but it's not, it's not an impossible thing to deal with. Um, for the most part, there's some pretty easy steps you can do to make yourself not feel quite so imposterish. I'll just briefly go over these uh, and explain them just a bit because I can already see I'm going to go over <laughs> in time. But uh, briefly, first know that you're experiencing it. Seriously, 70% of us, that's like all of that side of the room, not this side, you guys are good. <laughs> all of that side of the room is an imposter. How do you feel about that? Yeah, 70%. Know that you're experiencing it and that it's a real thing and that you're not probably actually an imposter. Own your successes. When you do something right, know that you did that, right? Inside, no, it was you, not, it, 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 you didn't copy and paste that off of, well, maybe you did, but <laughs> slash dot script, but, but you put that solution together, right? Stop thinking that there's such a thing as perfect, okay? That's the big one. Always comparing yourself against this perfect ideal of what should be. <sighs> Nobody's perfect. There's not a single person in this room that's perfect. Know that you don't know everything and accept that, okay? That's pretty much what Google's for, isn't it? Yeah. So keep track of your successes and publish them, blog about them, tweet them. When you do something <laughs> that's really, really cool, and you tweet it, and somebody who you thought was so super smarter than you says, oh, that's cool, I didn't know that. It's, it's pretty validating, and it happens all the time. Um, and quit being afraid of being found out, especially in this community. I can't tell, this community loves newbies, okay? I, when I started out, and I was trying to, I was running my own development shop, Angie Byron said to me, no, 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 no. We need you as a beginner because we need to document how this works from a beginner's viewpoint. And it's the only place I've ever been where being a beginner was a benefit. So, especially here, love being not perfect, okay? And, and be open about it. I mean, we, that's just how this community works. And if it wasn't here, I probably wouldn't even be standing up here. I wouldn't be presenting because this community helped me get past that. We love you. Um, outside of imposter syndrome, I have some other tips for confidence in general. Uh, first of these is fitness. A lot of people might not want to hear this, but fitness is huge. Uh, it's really big for me. Um, seems to be working for him. Uh, anyhow, I had shoulder pain for, well, I've had shoulder pain for probably about 13 years now. I played football in high school. I beat shoulders up a lot and sitting in front of a computer for decades kind of made all the muscles go away and then my shoulders started to hurt and so I decided to do something about that and I started working out I decided I liked it and started seeing benefits from having exercise um, when I did this I realized that my, my brain was working better I was being more productive every time I'd work out I'd get a euphoria feeling and then I'd come back because I luckily I get to work from home and I set my own schedule so I could work out another day and I come back and my afternoons are way more productive than my mornings. Um, having done that, I, I can, uh, I moved from being obese, I was 264 pounds and I came down into normal after about three months. So I went from 264 down to 231 and then I started 
lifting weights, and I went from 231 to 231. But I went from obese down to overweight, down to normal. Um, and I realized that sitting at my computer wasn't going to help me live longer. It certainly wasn't going to make it so that I could see my kids' grandchildren, or my kids' children, my own grandchildren for as long. Um, I wasn't going to be able to go and experience things with my wife after our kids are grown and left. Because I'd be, if I felt like I had felt every morning, <laughs> I just I, did, I didn't want to do anything. So, also my wife pointed out that uh, we both aren't getting any more time every day. Hobbies eat up time. So, if we wanted to accomplish more, we are going to have to make more of ourselves. So I made an audacious goal, and I said that I want to compete in the 40 and over bodybuilding competition next year in my home state of Idaho. So if anybody knows what that's about, you know how much work is ahead of me. Uh, and if you don't, then that means I'm going to be standing in front of a very large audience in a bikini, <laughs> trying to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger from Terminator. It makes presenting to this audience not seem all that big of a deal, honestly. <laughs> So that's the part where I get embarrassed with the kids a lot. It's kind of fun. <laughs> but anyhow, e even if I don't manage to do that, even if I don't qualify for competing, I'm still going to be like 7 billion times better off than I am right now, right? It, well, and I'm not doing too bad right now either. I mean, I seriously, I went from obese to normal. And that only took three months. So no matter what, it's going to work. And I highly implore all of you, don't try taking up diets. Don't, don't do fads. That crap does not work. Move your body more. Just try and get up and do more with yourself. It's catchy. It actually works. And it changes your life. So apparently uh, CHX had mentioned that somebody had been trying to get a true full fitness phenomenon going and it hadn't caught on. And I'm probably going to pick up that mantle and, and actually see if I can't get it to catch on. Because it matters. Our, our community, probably one of the more fit technology communities that I've seen wandering about different tech centers. But we can all do better, and we can all improve our lives. Oh. Is he still there? Is he still there? Ah. What if you need the, the benefits of, say, a, an exercise that, that, that endorphins feeling, you know, the lower cortisol? This will do it for you. There's a, 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 a TED talk by, uh, what's her name? Amy Cuddy. Look it up. Um, it'll be in the resources at the end. About, about body hacks, confidence hacks using your body. Powerful. It's just standing here for two minutes in a powerful position. Well, actually, increase your endorphins and lower your cortisol and make you, I did it right before the session, actually. It was pretty handy. Uh, scientifically speaking, it hacks your, your body into thinking that you're more confident, and it, you, you are more confident. So give it a try if you have a meeting or something that you're kind of nervous about. Um, now let's get back on to communication. This one's sort of a combination of things, uh, like technical trans translation between like the business world and the tech world, uh, diplomacy, salesmanship. Um, nowadays in my position at the Forest Service, I get to work with this one a lot more. There's interdepartment relationships. There's politically hot topics I have to avoid. Uh, lots of stakeholders that I have to convince and sell. Actually, before I go on to that, um, I want to discuss something that I think might even be more important, and that's finding the actual need of your customer. So I'm going to hop to this one real quick. It's, it's more important, and we might run out of time. So, um, Customers often don't know what they need. Uh, and when they're discussing things, sometimes they're, they're telling you about the things they want or something cool they saw. Uh, or maybe they know something and they can't really articulate it. And this is the place where I think we, as solution people, can be a lot more helpful. First, find out what they want. You, you can do that by helping them to describe it as a user story uh, with actual numbers. And if they're not using numbers, or if that, they're not using definite terms, help them to quantify. Uh, often the customer will give you a vague, feely sorts of words like, like flexible or maintainable or fast or inexpensive, you can't use those. That's not, there's not a definition around 
fast. Um, if you leave your requirements like that, your developers won't have what they need to build solutions. And this is good for us at any point. We can help dig for those solutions even if we are just developers. So, and at the end, you won't have anything to go on to know if you've gotten your task done. So, there was a fantastic example uh, by Keith Braithwaite in a book called 97 Things Every Software Architect Should Know. And it was, must respond to user input in no more than 1,500 milliseconds. Under normal load, to find out, the average response time between 750 and 1,250 milliseconds. Response time is less than 500 milliseconds. Can't be distinguished by the user, so we're not going to pay for that. That's, that's a real requirement, okay? When we're getting stuff like, I, the user experience needs to be better, and, you know, the users have to be able to do this thing more quickly. That's not going to define well enough to make tasks and user stories from. So really help your customers. Quantify. Um, the questions you can ask to get through that is how fast, how many, how much. Ask the questions. Get the quantified answers. If they're still having trouble with that, um, you might be able to use the tool, the five whys. Is anybody familiar with this one? Five Ways is a methodology that was created by Toyota uh, during one of their reinventions. And basically, it's just a good way to get to the bottom of any problem. Uh, here's an example off of Wikipedia. It's a really big problem. The battery's dead. Why? Well, the alternator's not functioning. Okay, why? Well, the alternator belt's broken. Okay, why? Uh, well, it was worn out beyond its useful service life and not replaced. Okay, why? The vehicle was not maintained according to its maintenance schedule. That's the root. Now, you can use this problem in just about, or you can use this, this why, this digging why, why, why solution finder in just about anything. And I can bet you can imagine plenty of scenarios that where Drupal's cache hasn't been cleared is the third or fourth why. <laughs> <laughs> it happens every time. So, um, now let's get back to the communication part. We are pretty much So, um, in all my previous roles, I've been fairly technical minded. I, I spoke Drupal to people, people spoke Drupal back to me. That was pretty much the job. My current role, I don't get to speak technically. Like, um, I'll talk about how our department can support and facilitate other departments and sell on how necessary we are and convince them how our product can reduce drains on web budgets while simultaneously increasing time utilization for content entry. Of course, you know I'm talking about creating a face profile thing. That's it. But that's not how you talk to them. You don't say, I'm creating a face profile with a face theme based on bootstrap, and we're going to, they're, they're just going to look at you like you're all looking at me right now. Hmm. Um, so we, we can't talk like that when we get to this point. We really have to start talking about things like needs and desires and budgets and, you know, and documents and, and helping and support. These are the words that you talk back to them. That's the language that they're speaking. And I, I don't really have a suggestion on how to, how to accommodate that other than learning your business side of things, such as if you're in the medical industry, learning the medical business. If you're in government, learning your acronyms. If you're in insurance, learning that language. You learn their language to, and, and start using it. And the more and better you do that, the more of a benefit you're going to be to your customer. They should. I'll just say it this way. They should never have to learn our language, okay, ever. No customer should have to learn Drupal to talk to us. So once you start talking their language, you might often have to do it in a persuasive manner. I love this one. This is like that meme. <laughs> this is what I call salesmanship because often you, don't, you have to sell your problem or your, your, your solution or yourself uh, to to get the solution that you know they need into their hands. Um, I'm only gonna make one point in this, and that's that you don't sell features, you sell benefits. When you're talking to them, you tell them how it will help them. You do not tell them what it will do. They don't care about the workflow module. They don't. They don't care about Akamai. They care about faster response times and how their editors can contribute content safely. Talk solutions, talk benefits. Do not talk 
or talk, don't talk solutions, talk benefits. I'm gonna skip right on through here. Uh, <laughs> trust your team. Um, we're completely out of time, I think. Oh no, we're at 15 minutes. Oh, we're good, okay. So now you're this bigger person. When you get to be the architect, you're gonna have a higher stakes position. You're gonna have a higher profile position. It's gonna be one where it makes you feel like, I, I really need to get this done. I must make this happen. Now, you get there, you don't solve problems by telling everybody to, mm, yeah, can you work on Sunday? We need that TPS report. You don't do that. You do that by surrounding yourself by extremely smart people and listening to them and having them help you solve problems and then trusting them when you give them the work to do and then crediting them when they've done it well. That's a really short synopsis. <laughs> Thank you. The full credit thing is really, really cool because then it shows your customer that you've got a team rather than just a bunch of people that are costing them money. They like that. Um, sped right through that, good deal. So here's some of the resources that I've been looking at. Now I'll tell you, I got a lot out of a couple of these and I didn't get so much out of the other ones because I got bogged down because I couldn't understand them. The first one, O'Reilly Software Architecture Fundamentals video series, that one's awesome. They're kind of boring to listen to, but they're a good, good video presentation on the broader terms of software architecture and getting you to understand what that world's all about. The next one, uh, Amy Cuddy's 20 minute talk on body hacks. Definitely watch that. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's really fascinating and it'll really help you in case you ever have to get here. Um, 97 things every software architect should know. Really quick ebook, it's on O'Reilly's website, it's a good one. Uh, software architecture, software systems architecture, working with stakeholders and viewpoints and perspectives. I'm bogged down in that one. I'm bogged down in the next one too. Uh, although they're both supposed to be really good. Um, software architecture practice, and then of course you get down to the blog of James L. Tucher. This guy interviews everybody, by the way. Uh, if you get a chance to go read his blog, you'll be fascinated. He's, some of the people he's interviewed and gotten bits of wisdom from are, it's awesome. And then success principles, how to get from where you are to where you wanna be by Jack Canfield, the guy who wrote the Chicken Soup for the Soul series of books. He wrote this book too. Um, literally changed my life, good book. So. Here's some things that some of my friends have tweeted at me when I implored them to please tell me how to be an architect, please. <coughs> you can thank this guy for that one. <laughs> this one says, architecture is where soft skills and tech skills meet, fornicate and produce a bouncing baby product. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Next one is uh, by Zen Doodles. Remember the Scotty principle when estimating, that's the one I talked about multiplying by a factor of. Josh Brower says, seek first to understand the problem you're asked to solve is rarely the problem the client wants to solve. Larry had another one. Your job is to figure out how to make your dev team bored, not needing any custom code. Then Doodles had another one. When defining requirements, negotiate for the 95% solution you can do with 5% of the effort. I like that one. I didn't really mention that in the uh, thing because it's pretty well summarized right there. Larry here says, sometimes, Larry, you're like all over this. <laughs> sometimes a small change to the design can save 40 hours of work. Your job is to help the client make an informed call on that. Next, Ern, oh yeah, Earl Miles, the guy who wrote Views and Chaos Tools, might know something. Learn the Drupal way, but don't be slavish to it. It's not the right, it's not always right. Sometimes it's just history. And it's changing a lot now anyhow, going into Drupal 8, so it's very right on that. Uh, Larry said, Something similar, go with the grain. Drupal has a very strong grain. It's right more often than you think, but not always. Damian McKenna said, Working with P work with PMs to get a better handle on estimating. I covered that pretty well. CHX said, experience is, I have already made the mistake you're about to make. <laughs> uh, put the nuclear bomb behind that one too, it works. Josh Brower on hiring people far more qualified than themselves. His goal is always to be the dumbest guy in the room. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> that worked. Nice. <laughs>
Seriously, anybody got any questions? Five minutes. Seriously, you guys actually get to walk around a little bit now. Enjoy some air. We got out early. Thanks for the applause. That's awesome.